I want to talk about prayer, and in the fourth chapter of Philippians, the sixth verse, be careful for nothing, that is, have no care about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And so I'm going to choose this phrase, in everything by prayer, and in doing it I'll not be doing violence to the scriptures, because what it actually says is, in everything by prayer and supplication, but supplication is a form of prayer, with thanksgiving, but thanksgiving is a form of prayer. Let your requests be made known, and letting your requests not be made known is a form of prayer. So, in everything by prayer is what the Holy Spirit said. Now, this is a remarkable phrase, and it is a key to the treasure house of God, and all that God has is ours. But we are not enjoying all that God has, either because we don't know it's ours, or because we have not practiced in everything by prayer. Now here we have an unfailing technique for spiritual success, and this motto, in everything by prayer, is one that might well be on the cornerstone of every church building. And uh, it ought to be in every pulpit, and it ought to be in every boardroom. In fact, for the average boardroom, I would suggest four of them, one for each wall, large enough so that no matter which way a board member was looking, he'd see it in everything by prayer. Now, uh, I don't know whether my method is a good one or not, but the uh, brother's going to speak on absolutely nothing. And I whispered to somebody that I do that myself frequently, but I don't know whether the getting out into the philosophy of things, but I like to do it that way. And so I want to show you why this morning. Everything we do in God's church has to be done by prayer. I want to show you why. Now, it isn't simply that the Lord said it, now you believe it. But there's a reason why he said it. There's a reason for its being true. And the reason is that there coexist two kingdoms. There is the kingdom of man and the kingdom of God, and these coexist, and to some measure they mingle, but not too much. They touch at any rate, and they live side by side with each other. And it's the kingdom of man into which we are born. When we're born and the doctor says it's a boy, it's a girl, we are born into the kingdom of man. That's the exiled man who is in rebellion against God. That's fallen man. We were all born to fallen parents into a fallen society and became members of a fallen race by nature. And uh, this, this fallen race, this, uh, this race of man, they disagree an awful lot. But they're, they're in agreement on certain things. You remember how Herod and Pilate had been enemies. And then, when they came to judging Jesus, they made themselves friends again. They were, they were apart on certain political things, but they were together on this, that they weren't going to have anything to do with Jesus. And so in the world out there, we have the West against the East, and we have races against race, and we have political party against political party, and uh, all this kind of division. But uh, those are local things. Actually, the human race agrees on one thing. The human race agrees on the basic principle that, that we call human self-sufficiency. We believe that we are sufficient unto ourselves. People believe that. Oh, you occasionally will find a poor little chap with no chin, infected and distressed, who goes about not thinking much of himself, but if you'll press him and press him, you will learn after a while that he has quite a high opinion of himself and his ability. And if he doesn't have of himself, he does have of humanity. And he believes in what they call the instinctive wisdom of the race. 
Now, it's a strange thing that the great philosophers, I'm thinking particularly now of Emerson, talk about the instinctive wisdom of the race, whereas God talks about the folly of the human race. The God says that we are fools and men say we're wise men. God says that we act like foolish children and know not as much as an ox knows, for he knows his home and knows how to come back, and a bird knows its nest and knows how to fly home. But we don't know our spiritual home and we don't know the hand that feeds us and uh, we're not sufficient unto ourselves. And then we believe in the soundness of moral judgments. We believe, the human race believes, that uh, there may be a little mistake here and there, and there may be a juvenile delinquent and a beatnik occasionally show up, but that for the most part we know what is right, and we believe in the soundness of our moral judgments. And then they believe in human righteousness, allowing for a few flaws. We believe in that human beings are right and good. I wrote something one time to the effect that... Uh, what did I say? I don't remember how I worded it, but to the effect that people were bad, the world was bad, and a woman, a very intelligent woman, obviously, from her letter, wrote me a very sharp letter and wanted to know what was the matter with me, that I would uh, make such a statement that the human race was bad. Didn't I know that they were conquering cancer? Didn't I know that they were conquering polio? Didn't I know that men were becoming brothers? Didn't I know that there were hospitals everywhere, that we were taking care of the insane? Didn't I know that we had children's asylums where children went and were cared for? Didn't I know that that uh, insane people were not driven out into the bushes as they used to be, but were cared for. Didn't I know these things? Well, I don't know whether she was asking me uh, merely rhetorical questions or whether she thought that I just had never been to school. But uh, I did know those things, but I still believe in the basic badness of the human race. I do know those things, but I believe in the basic evil of the human race. I came up from uh, New York Friday night. And sitting by to my left was a man who told me, that a middle-aged man, who said he'd been 30 years a newspaper editor in the city in, the, uh, in Canada. And uh, we, we, I, you know, when you're up against a man like that, you're careful what you say. But pretty soon I forgot that I was talking to a man that knew the world pretty well. And we got to discussing politics and communism and religion. And I told him uh, he was very much distressed. He's a very fine gentleman. He was very much distressed over, over world conditions, particularly over the breakdown of the home. And I said to him, well, don't you know, don't you know that this is simply a proof of uh, John Calvin's belief that in, in the total depravity of the human race? And he said that he did. Now, his name was Pat Kelly, and he was an Anglican. He was an Anglican. And I believe he said, if I recall, that he was uh, the chairman of the Red Cross, either Red Cross or Heart or, or Cancer Society of Canada. Anyway, he, he believed in that. And he, he said, I hope you won't think that I am too, that I'm too pessimistic. And I said, no, I've just written a book that's worse than that. It's just about as bad. Because I don't believe in humanity. I don't believe in the goodness of people unless God helps us, unless God gets into us. Or unless we get into the kingdom of God, people are not good by nature, they're bad. But uh, we don't believe it. Humanity doesn't believe that. People don't believe it. And there's man's kingdom filled with, with the subjects of, uh, of Satan. Uh, and it's organized and it's implemented by science and it has in its favor history and familiarity and visible success. And uh, it is of the flesh, and it's from the flesh, and it's for the flesh, and it's dedicated to the flesh and to the passing world. Now, that's the kingdom of man into which you and I are born, regardless of our race. That's the kingdom into which we're born, a fallen, hostile, alienated race. 